right, Alma, thanks for being here. Hey, Alma, you know, you're a sociologist of education, mm -hmm. okay? Can you define that for us? Help us see what you do, sure. uh, not only what you study and what you do, um, and help us understand like what you see about our education system today. Yeah, so I really like to say that I am a sociologist of education because often when I say that my PhD is in education, a lot of people want to know how, you know, best like teaching techniques and ways yeah, to yeah, engage yeah, yeah. students. And I'm like, no, no, that's not what I got my degree <laughs> in. Um, I actually look at more uh, at schools more from a structural perspective and a political perspective and sort of its role in society as a whole. And, in, you know, just with different populations. And I specifically focused all of my research um, on people of color, low-income students in inner cities and the role of uh, schools in helping to alleviate some of the circumstances that they were going through and kind of, you know, persevering through that process onto like higher education institutions. Great, great. So what, what got you started on that journey? And tell us some of your story and how you uh, went on this path to become a sociologist of education. Sure. So I actually didn't really ever have this dream that I was going to get a PhD one day. It all kind of spiraled out of control when I first like had uh, a degree under my belt, and I was like, "Whoa! Like I got a high school degree, and I'm the first in my family to get a high school degree." And I thought it was like. It was like a really big deal, and I thought, wow, maybe I could get another one. Like, you know, that wasn't that hard. Like, I, mean, I yeah. think I got, I got something, you know. Yeah. And so, it honestly, like during that time, I was also was not a believer. So I had a very like materialistic way of seeing my degree. I was like, yeah, then I'm gonna be bawling out of control because <laughs> I'm gonna be a doctor, and you know, it's gonna be Wrong awesome. Wrong kind of doctor, right? <laughs> yeah. Little did I know though, because I had no idea, yeah, right? Yeah, my yeah, yeah. parents didn't go to college. I couldn't ask them about like different kinds of doctors and doctorates and what the difference was. And so a lot of it was like trial and error for me. Yeah. Um, but obviously, you know, providentially orchestrated and. Um, I w that was a lot of what I, I credit, you know, my accomplishments to and being able to go through that. I'm a first generation uh, student as well. So mm. my parents came here during uh, Reagan's administration, which granted amnesty to all that were already here. Yeah. And so they were able to become legal citizens uh, or legal residents. And then I was, you know, I was born here. And so sort of the first gen, you know, kind of trajectory that I'm on. Awesome, awesome. So, uh, you know, with education and with, uh, again, your studies and also your work, uh, what do you notice about our education system and what do you notice about maybe even the inequalities or mm -hmm. in inequities that are in our society? Yeah, so I recently was reading a book that really just totally shifted my perspective on these issues. I hadn't, you know, because I went to a secular, more secular sort of institution, I learned things from a very, you know, um, basically not through like a divine lens, right? So like yeah. through my own um, beliefs. And so a lot of that has come after now. So I've been trying to read more on different perspectives. And one of the things that has really struck me and that I'm kind of carrying right now a lot and, you know, kind of thinking through is this idea that um, not only are we educationally segregated, as in, mm. you know, in different uh, locations uh, in terms of schools, by income and sometimes race, but also how we live like that mm. in general. That's just... Especially in L.A. Yes, yeah. in L.A. and in, you know, a lot of parts in the U.S. Mm -hmm. uh, we just, you know we don't understand others' perspectives, and I think that's because we grow up in a sort of in a neighborhood where we are only used to those like us, yeah. right? So whether they're like lower income, like in my case, I was, you know, I knew a lot of people who were also like had working class parents, and we were, you know, just very similar experiences versus like someone who maybe is middle to upper income and sort of they have their own sort of different experiences, you know, with, with that, so. Yeah. So then as you look at this, um, as, as you look at the segregation, how do you propose that we can start to have that conversation with each other? And how do churches, how might churches be involved in that as well? Yeah, that's a great question. I actually was, have been thinking through that myself because 
now having you know have you know having a profession where I am able to sort of live in a different neighborhood that I grew up in, sometimes I find myself like looking around and thinking like, wow, everyone's just like me, just like how I am so critical of others that are just like uh, yeah. with themselves. I'm like, that's me right now. Like that's <laughs> problematic, you know. Yeah. And so one of the things that I think we can start to even do, you know, bridge that uh, across the church aisles or even outside the church is just befriending different kinds of people, you know. Mm. And some of the research shows that if a person, a young person knows someone who has gone through college and that know, has this kind of social capital about how you do that, you know, what kinds of processes that entails, yeah. that it could really change their lives because right. they just don't have access to people that they can sort of uh, ask that of, right? Right. Similar to my own story. Right. So with this segregation and with even segregation of education, you know, how else do you see other social justice issues play into some of this um, yeah. stuff? They're definitely interrelated and, mm. you know, it's sort of uh, intersections of different inequalities and and injustices. I, I definitely see it with poverty. Like I just see sort of the cyclical nature of poverty when you're, you know, the chances of, of you being poor are, you know, heightened by the by the fact that you were just in a poor, come from a poor family. Right. And this is cyclical nature of that and right. how, um, you know, and then that also affects like your educational outcomes and wanting to sort of or knowing how to even like break out of that cycle and that sort of thing. And then a lot of that is racial, right? Because we live in a nation that at one point didn't allow non-whites and women to go to school and kind of get an education. And so we're seeing sort of like a betterment from that, you know, from that situation in the past, but definitely still some residue from what that kind of created in, in our current state. That's right, that's right. Well, yeah. you know, my parents, Growing up, I'm, I'm Korean, okay? My parents, they're immigrants too. And so then as, as I was growing up, they said, hey, you need to study hard, okay? So that you could get a good degree, so you could get a good job. Is, there, is that equation an important equation for us to achieve? Or is that, is that something, is, is there something wrong with that equation these days? I think there is. I think that that's a very materialistic way of thinking about it, right? Like okay. you're just like, okay, go get this so you could get some later. Like kind of how I used to think about it as like, oh, I'm going to be balling out of control when I'm like <laughs> have a bachelor's because that's what my motivation was for so long. You know, teachers would show me like, look, see this chart shows that if you graduate from high school, you're only going to make this much. You know, I'm sure we've all seen that chart. And yeah. if you keep going, basically you're going to be balling out of control. And yeah. so I, I, that was my impetus for so long. And so I totally relate to that. But I think, um, you know, I like to say the story of like when I finally got my PhD and then the next day I was just walking around. I don't know what I was doing, but I was just like, oh, I guess I'm still me. I just have a PhD now, <laughs> you know? And a lot more debt, yeah. Yeah, and, well, actually, I was able to not get into any debt oh, as a result of that. But I was just like, oh, it's this, it wasn't this transformative thing that like all of a sudden I'm like, you know, somehow it, it's like a status symbol that people know and, you know, um, and then it kind of took that to realize like, okay, that's, I'm thinking of this all wrong. Like, how can I use this instead to sort of promote, you know, what I want to see in the world? And that's sort of just a, you know, less oppressive system against yeah. poor people, against people who are first generation in this country yeah. and that sort of thing. Yeah. As Christians and, you know, not everyone in this room has a doctorate, right? As Christians, how can we participate in making our system less oppressive? I think there's very um, tangible ways that day-to-day yeah. -day you can do. I think there's just like a myriad of things you can do. And I think part of what happens is we get caught up in this idea that like, oh my gosh, it's just so much, like I can't do anything about it because we keep hearing all these negative news stories about so-and-so is sexually abusing everyone in Hollywood and so-and-so is whatever, and you're just like, what is the world? Like, Jesus, come already, you know? Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's very paralyzing sometimes, right. and I think, uh, I think that uh, the devil uses that to make us think that there's nothing to do, and there's so much to do on a day-to-day, -day, to like a week basis, to like a lifetime basis, and some of the ways that I feel like you could even start now is being very diligent about your own income and your own budgets and your own money so that later you can give and you can, when you're older, you have this like capital that you can 
um, donate, you know, yeah. like, uh, I mean, as a first gen, I think there's a struggle because we, I, I'm not inheriting anything, right? Like there's this gap in generational wealth, like no one owns a home in my family, no one uh, has like this, you know, whatever uh, other kinds of financial planning needed to happen. Um, and a lot of times I think we see that as like, well, that's just being overly concerned about money and about materialistic things, but really, I mean, if that's sort of like the currency, you know, that's yeah. ways that we can help others. And it's okay to, even if, if you want to do that, you can do it through that means. And of course, there's also the whole just mentoring aspect. I think you can always mentor someone younger, someone in a different uh, neighborhood than maybe the one you grew up in mm. and inspiring them, giving them hope for like a different kind of life. Um, because there's also a lot of research that shows that you know, a lot of students that are, or people that are poor also are entangled in a lot of like alcoholism and other kinds of abuse in the yeah. family. And so yeah. there's just a need there for people to even just have friends or mentors that are non judgmental, just kind of, uh, you know, someone that's hearing them out and kind of helping them through life. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks for sharing uh, some of that. So I'm going to call time out here. Okay. And I'm going to invite you guys to text in social media and questions to Alma. And we're going to get to your questions right after our reflection song. All right, thanks guys. All right, Alma, we're gonna get to some of our questions and here's our first question, okay? You said it's important to befriend people of different races, backgrounds. It feels really unnatural and awkward to go out of the way to do that. How do I, how do I go about that and make it more natural? That's a great question. I got that a lot when I was uh, teaching a privilege and oppression class at Chapman University. Yeah. Um, where, you know, it's, especially if you're used to sort of being in a certain circle, it's really hard sometimes to relate or to kind of feel like you're just trying to get brownie points for befriending that person or yeah, whatever, yeah. you know, like yeah. uh, heaven points or whatever. Um, I would just say like if you're in spaces that seem unnatural and awkward, you're actually doing great. You should be feeling unnatural and awkward, yeah. you know? Um, whether they want to be your friend or not is probably a whole other question, right? <laughs> <laughs> like sometimes because we live in a society that maybe, you know, that where people start to develop very personal feelings against certain communities because of just the inequality, um, it might be hard. Like people may be at first like, wait, why are, you know, why is this happening? And yeah. I'm not a charity case. Like, what are you doing? You know? Right. And I think if you, if your heart's really there and you're really just, there to want to make a difference, to want to, you know, challenge yourself, I think it will become evident to people, you know, um, and they will be more likely to re to receive it in a different way than if it were like, all right, I got to check off my three people I got to meet today from a different, <laughs> like, cultural background. You're black. Let's, let's talk, you know? <laughs> like, obviously, there's, um, that would be totally not the way to do it. Um, but I think... You know, um, it's already really awkward and unnatural when we try to talk to others, right? Like when you're befriending someone or you're just right. shooting the breeze. So, I mean, it's no different. There, yeah. Other people also talk and they, yeah. even though that you've never been around them maybe, or, you know, it's just no different. So yeah. you would treat it almost as if you would any other person that you're trying to befriend. Yeah. Um, I, you know, I, I say it's kind of like dating. You know, yeah. you're going and meeting somebody else and <laughs> you're awkward. asking about the question. It's awkward, right? That's just the There's way There's no is. way to un awkward time, that. <laughs> right. But at the same time, I'm just trying to get to know the other person, right. hear their story. It's a little unnatural at first, but after a while, I hear who they are and, and appreciate who they are, too. Right. Great. All right. Here's another question. Okay. What are other ways we can help low-income students other than giving them money? Um, mentorship. So yeah. um, I, there's a lot of programs, either through churches or universities, that go out to different um, high, like high schools or middle schools um, where you can participate as a mentor. Um, and, you know, mentorship, it sounds so like, oh, man, that means I have to have my stuff together. Like, I don't know if I could do that. Right. But it really isn't. You know, like, it's really more about... Um, just being an open ear to someone who maybe needs to talk about stuff and whatever it is, just giving them that space because yeah. you may be the only person that they can feel safe with maybe, you know? So, and there's also a lot of organizations, I think nonprofits that you can do a lot of that work where you're not, you're investing, you know, instead of your treasure. So like time, you know, in, instead of treasure, you're investing time. And so that's another way to definitely uh, help other 
populations. Great, great. Okay, here's another question. Okay, what, where is the line between offering people hope for a different life and encouraging them in a way that's materialistic? Mm, that's a great question. Th I'm telling you, their questions yeah, are better than mine, yeah, always. These are harder than the ones way, you asked. Way harder, <laughs> always. Um, I think that, you know, I, and I shared my experience too with that because I definitely, when I was pursuing my own degree, it was from a very materialistic perspective. And then, obviously, I, I met, you know, Jesus, and I sort of transformed my life. And I think that as you live out your life as a mentor, as a person with, with others, um, those, the part of you that is also, you know, a believer that's who you are is going to be reflected in your interactions. And they're going to be like, whoa, that person's different. Like, they didn't care that I'm all about, you know, whatever, owning a convertible or something, I don't know. Um, you know, just like they, they really helped me think past that. Like they were asking me more about, you know, my own, my own sort of beliefs or maybe like ideas, why I think this way and sort of challenging um, why we're doing things. Um, so I don't know if I'm totally understanding or addressing that question, but, um, I, you know, I think there's, in the way that you live out life with, people, um, they will hear that there's more to it than just like the, con you know, the materialistic issues, Absolutely. you know, that are, are there. So great. Great. Yeah. Okay. Here's another question for us. Okay. What have been the struggles, benefits as a Latina of going through the whole educational system to now having your PhD? Um, I would say it's mostly been struggles. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, there have been so many struggles. I would probably take 10 minutes just going through them right now if I had to list them all, so I'm not gonna do that. Um, but I think uh, one struggle has been always being a Latina in the classroom and being like, it's obvious, like you're the only Latina in here. You know, like that always feeling like, yeah, I'm the only Latina. You know, like that sort of, that I carried around a lot in grad school and that was really hard. It, it kind of like, really made me sort of understand and myself and my own sort of, you know, beliefs at a deeper level so that I can still be confident, still be, um, I was gonna say a, a, a word in Spanish, but I, I just realized it's a bad word in Spanish, so I should probably just <laughs> say it. But, um, uh, you know, being a chingona, I'm just gonna say it. Um, you know, and like, sometimes I have to embrace that. Like, I just have to embrace my chingonaness. That's what got me through, and you know, God helped me with that, and I had to just, you know, it was part of who I am, you know? And that was hard, like, I definitely did not start off that way. I was very yeah. much like, oh my gosh, like, what am I doing here? And I just had to learn and grow, and I think that was a benefit. I, I realized, like, oh snap, like, I, I can hang in, the, in like intellectual conversations with people where before I really doubted myself or I kind of didn't think that was possible. And I also, at one point, um, thought like, oh yeah, I totally don't need this PhD anymore. You know, I, there was like a, a low light in my grad studies where I was like, I'm okay with dropping out right now. I'm a, a PhD dropout. I don't have no qualms about saying that. I'm ready to do this. <laughs> and then, uh, you know, my husband had to be like, uh, no, like we did not come this far. <laughs> he had like taken ownership of it. Like, no, you have put us through hell. So now you're going to do this. <laughs> and finish that's, it up, and it that up. was just the reality of it. It was just like a very stressful time, you know? And so it's taken me a couple of years to kind of like, recenter and be like, okay, yeah, I can celebrate birthdays now. I have time to do stuff. Like, let's do this. <laughs> right on, right on, right on. So what was that word again? Chiguana? Chingona. What? I don't, I, you don't have to. Uh, okay, all right. I, you know, like, I wish you, I knew. Y'all know. The ones that know, they know. All right, so. all right. I'll ask, cool. I'll ask somebody later. Okay. <laughs> Explain it to the one next to you if they don't know. Okay, so. okay. All right, here's, here's a uh, really long question that's a little hard for me to read, but I'll do my best. Okay, being a first generation student, what is the best advice would you give to another first gen student? And as a friend to many first gen students, how can I best help and encourage them as they navigate college? Mm. Are there any specific actions or words of encouragement you would find to be most helpful? Mm. Wow, that's deep. Because if you're a first gen student, you're probably also going through a lot of similar sort of um, questions and trials that your friends are. I would say you all need to find an ally in the mm. university, someone who's gonna take you under their wing and just 
uh, help you understand and um, just process what you're going through. Mm. I think um, you need to stop and just really kind of hear your heart and like acknowledge it. And it's okay to have those moments where you just connect on a some more sort of emotional, you know, level because there's just it's a lot sometimes, especially if you're come from like a working class background where there's like finances is a big thing where you're struggling with or that sort of thing. I think I think it's awesome, by the way, that you are in a group of um, friends that are also going through similar things because yeah. I think it just legitimizes your own um, sort of experience. And I think I would just find as many allies as possible that are like adults in the university that can help you navigate it because they probably either have helped others or they will know someone to to kind of help you through just all of the things that need to get done when you're in college, yeah. you know? Great, so. great, thanks for that. Okay, here's yeah. another question. When, in times of discouragement during school, what helped you push through? Um, I definitely, my relationship with Christ. Yeah. I, there was days where I was just like, Jesus, take the wheel. Like, I'm just not <laughs> going to go to, I just don't want to do this. Like, I, if you're cool, I'm cool. I can drop out right now. And no one, you know, no feel, no hurt feelings on my end. Yeah. <laughs> you know? So I really feel like that's what got me through because at one point I just didn't care anymore. I was just like, I don't need, I don't need a PhD. You know, like, it's fine. Like, I'm still a very respectable human. Like, I'm going to be, be all right. Right, know? right, right. <laughs> um, so it was literally like, being in the word every single day and i think i had to go through that to also understand how powerful that is because before then and after then i have not ever been in the word that much so dependent on god yeah. and so i think it was it wasn't even about the phd anymore it was about god wanting to strengthen this relationship and yeah, even good. giving that up to him and being like okay i i relinquish my chingona ness phd ness <laughs> like just make it all go away now and it was like nope you're gonna go through this and this is the real reason you're going through this kind of thing all right all right well here's another question okay what are some policy recommendations that you would think would be really helpful in improving our educational system to better serve the mm. poor and people of color? Yeah, this one's a hard question because I think we've done that in our country so much, and I'm, I'm thinking this more nationally, more sort of systemic, and often we th it's a very complicated issue, and we, I think we, we fail ourselves short when we want to have a policy instituted, right? So we have yeah. to think about all the different dimensions that... Uh, affects people of color in their educational trajectories um, and, and also people that are poor that come from like rural backgrounds that don't have access and that sort of thing. Um, and that's very sometimes, uh, you know, much more localized, like the needs are, are different depending on where in the United States they are at, you know. And so um, I always kind of like, you know, just kind of cringe when I'm like, when I hear about like a policy kind of way to solve this because um, I just don't think that that's, uh, you know, one policy is going to solve it all. It's mm. obviously we haven't solved it all with the policies because yeah. we just suck and we just <laughs> think that a policy is going to solve it all. Every time it's all like, well, let's do a policy and that's going to, you know, like, and it's, every time it's like, no, it doesn't work that way. There's, it's just so many issue interrelated issues, you know, and so... Um, I, you know, I, I guess if I would have to say something more local is just giving local communities a sort of more control for and help with what they need, like what are the immediate needs in these in this community, starting sort of like from a bottom up perspective, um, and then finding the different ways that are interrelated. So, like I, you know, I mentioned earlier, like um, most people live very segregated lives, if not. Eth you know, ethnically than racially, like you're probably, or, or, or uh, socioeconomically. So you're probably hanging out with people that come from very similar socioeconomic backgrounds, for example, or even if maybe they are some, you know, diversity in terms of ethnicity. So, um, you know, that's a whole other, like how do we fix that with policy? Like everyone has to make a friend that, but you know, like there's just, it's just so complicated. It's much right. more like about the heart and like your sort of individual convictions to, to not just be a product of your society, but to transform it, you know? Yeah, that's good, that's good. Yeah. One, one last question, what's it like being married to a Christian rapper? 
Um, it's really fun. I get all kinds of backstage passes and stuff. <laughs> I hope so. I'm balling out of control. No, I'm just kidding. I'm finally balling. No, we're not. We totally are not. But I get to meet pretty awesome people. I think that's, that's one of the, like, I actually uh, had a private tour of um, where I got this key from, the Giving Keys. I don't know if you, anyone's familiar with that, but it's this awesome organization that hires homeless people and um, they train them to to put like these like words on on keys. Um, so mine says chingona. I just got it. <laughs> <laughs> That's a theme today, huh? It's, um, it's a very oh, big it's on theme your today, it's on your okay? jacket too. There you go. Okay. <laughs> so, um, and then they train them with like like other skills. So like they'll train them to become like then managers of the other workers and then to also learn like Excel word kinds of tools that they can then move on and take to a different, um, you know, like for a different job. So I get to meet like pretty amazing people like that. Yeah. And, you know, I'm, I'm very thankful for that. Great, yeah. great. Hey, let's thank Alma for sharing her wisdom with us yeah. today. Biola University prepares Christians to think biblically about everything from science to business to education and the arts. Learn more at biola.edu.